Hey, Real Dealers, this is Charles Blair, the Mad Scientist, and we are streaming live on five, I repeat, five different networks. Now, the key to today's discussion is all about getting your REI questions answered. And let me turn down the volume, put the phone on silence. I am so blessed to be here with you guys this morning. I hope you are having a fantastic beginning of your weekend Friday morning. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Charles Blair and I am affectionately known as the Mad Scientist. We run the second, and when I say we, I mean my wife and I, we run the second largest real estate investing network in the nation called The Real Deal Meetup. We have over 8,000 members, and we would love to have you come join us. Now, you can reach out to us at therealdealmeetup.com. That is The Real Deal Meetup.com. Now, let's go over a couple of things that we are going to bring to topic today. First thing first, I want to let you guys know of all the upcoming events we have that is powered by the Real Deal Meetup. First and foremost, we have our Real Meals and Deals event that's going to be on July the 3rd at Ida B. Table located in downtown Baltimore. Fantastic networking opportunity for you guys where you will have an opportunity to get a fantastic, great meal at a great restaurant, soul food restaurant called Ida B. Table. And it is hosted by myself, Tammy Blair, and Corey Banks. And we always have a nice surprise guest that's going to really uh, give you guys some knowledge on real estate investing and real estate profession that we all love. Number two, we have the Baltimore REI Networking Mixer, and that is on July the 25th. That's located on the 19th floor of the Lord Baltimore Hotel. If you guys are able to make it, 6 o'clock till 9 p.m. Remember, it's going to be July the 25th. This is our networking mixer where we just basically shoot the breeze and talk about what's going on in business, talk about what's going on in your life, and just have fun. Last but not least, we have our Baltimore, or should I say our Real Deal Meetup event. It's always the fourth Saturday of the month. This month is going to be on July the 27th. So if you're not doing anything that day, you better not be doing anything that morning. You better be heading over to the Real Deal Meetup on July 27th. We love to have you guys in the house. So I want to first of all thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, R-E-W, thank you for tuning in, my friend. Kimberly, thank you for tuning in on YouTube. Greg, thank you for tuning in. Marsha, thank you for tuning in. Richard, thank you for tuning in on Instagram. Let me know, guys, if you can hear me. Anthony Jenkins, I'm glad you're here, my friend. Welcome to the broadcast. If you guys can hear me loud and clear, heart it up, like it up, put in the comment section, Charles, I can hear you so we can go ahead and make sure we don't have any technical gremlins. Now, the purpose of this broadcast is to answer each and every last one of you guys and gals real estate investing questions. Now, this is one of the ways in which my wife and I give back to the community. Uh, I've been a full-time investor for now over 30 years, and I love sharing my knowledge. I love to work with you guys. If you have any way in which we could work together, you would love to reach out to me. I can be reached at charles at realdealmeetup.com. That's charles at realdealmeetup.com. We are currently looking for deals, so make sure you put me in that deal list. Good morning, my friend Anthony. Welcome to the broadcast, my friend. Now, here's how it's going to work. Teal, welcome to the broadcast. Columbus, Ohio, checking in. Hey, I'm glad to have you out there in Columbus. Here's what I want you guys to do. On Instagram, we have Varnock checking in. 
please in the comment section below if you want to get your questions answered just post them in the comment section on the platform that you are listening to right now as i mentioned earlier we are on a number of platforms we are currently on facebook we are currently on twitch we're on instagram we're on youtube we are also on periscope so if you just paste in the comment section wherever you're at right now and we will make sure we get those questions answered jason my friend welcome to the broadcast i love love all the energy you guys are giving me and all the love you're giving me right now now first question comes from keith keith is a wholesaler and he really wants to scale his business he wants to know how do you go from one to two deals a month to scale your business to the point where you're doing five ten deals a month gary mckeon welcome to the broadcast keith that is a great question and the easiest way to answer that question is this you must first have a consistent business plan in place because in order to scale that business you have to be willing to work out of that business now think about what i just said when i say work out of the business i'm not talking about literally separating yourself from the business what i'm talking about is working on your business as opposed to working in your business so you want to take to the point the the process of okay i'm right now working x amount of hours doing one two three deals a month now how can i replicate myself how can i replicate my action how can i basically measure the consistency and have others do what i'm doing where i'm able to basically scale my business to higher heights and that's the key to what we're talking about it's all about scaling your business to the point where you're working on it as opposed to working in it. So the first thing you want to do is you want to basically make sure you document every SOP that's in your business. Basically, what I'm talking about is the standard operating procedure that you have in your business in order to do your business. You want to make sure there's a process in place where everything you're doing can be basically measured, everything that you're doing can be qualified everything that you're doing can be documented so that you can take your place in or out of your business and give it to someone else to do that's your key i mean you can decide to say i i'm going to do this i'm going to do that but if you want to scale your business you can't be that one trick pony you have to be that person who has a process in place who has the details in place where you can take what you're doing, plug other people's in, and then do it, have others do it. Now, the key here is this. Normally, what you're going to do is give the things that are the tedious task to someone else to do. Because those are, for the most part, the most time-consuming tasks. Now, when you take that approach... Now, you as the owner, as the manager of whatever you want to call your situation, you can now look at your business and say, here's the areas that are making me the money. Here's my areas of conversion. Is it negotiating? Is it marketing? Well, it's going to be one or the other if we're talking about in the real estate side. So... You can replace yourself doing a lot of real estate tasks, but you still have to come up with the proper task, the proper activities that you want to do that's going to give you the results that you want. So in other words, if you put garbage in a situation, you're going to get garbage out. Now, what do I mean by that? If you're doing strategies the wrong way, if you're executing an approach the wrong way, then the results you're going to get is going to be limited. So you as that thought provider, you as that boss have to decide is what I'm doing right and is going to give it is it going to give me the type of results I'm looking for so it's all about measuring 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 that's the key so when we talk about scaling your business it's not so much to do with automation but it has more cause and effect to do with replacing the tedious activities that you are doing and basically concentrating on maintaining the most profitable aspects of your business that's going to give you the biggest results.
Clarence, welcome to the broadcast. Jason, welcome to the broadcast. I hope that answered your question, Keith. Remember, if you guys have questions, put them in the comment section below. We have questions flying in all over the place from Facebook. We have them coming in from YouTube, coming in from Instagram. We have them coming in from Twitch and also Periscope. So the next question comes from Gary on Facebook. And Gary asks, with the Maryland foreclosure law, can I speak to a homeowner that contacts me because they know me and what I do? For the most part, Gary, the answer is it depends. And here's what I mean by that. The Maryland foreclosure law is PIFA. And PIFA, which means Protection of Homeowner and Foreclosure Act. That means that if the person, or should I say the law states that if a person is in foreclosure and they're over 30 days late on their mortgage payment. I'm sorry, 60 days late on their mortgage payment, not 30. 60 days late on their mortgage payment. You as the investor must re advise that homeowner that they must speak with a real estate agent or an attorney in order for you to proceed to buy that deal. Now, Gary, I'm asking you, the law states the moment you know that they're in foreclosure, meaning 60 days late or more on their mortgage. So to answer your question, if that person lives in the property and they're over 60 days late on their mortgage, you're required to refer them in the properties in Maryland. You're required to refer them to a real estate agent, actually, let me take out the word refer. You're required to tell them that they must get a real estate agent or an attorney to represent them so that you can buy the property. Now, if the person is not living in the property or the property is an investment property, you can buy and talk about that property all day long, regardless if it's in foreclosure or not. That's basically what the law states. If they live in the property, and the moment you find out from the owner that they're over 60 days late on their mortgage, you must relinquish any desire to negotiate with the owner at that point, referring the owner to get a real estate agent on their behalf. I hope that answers your question, Gary. Thank you, my friend, for being on the broadcast. Let's see who else we got here. Jason, thank you for being on the broadcast. Beto, good morning back at you, my brother, from another mother. Uh, Mark Rowe, Mark, 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 my brother from a true brother from another mother growing up in the projects of East Baltimore. I love you, my man. We got to hook up soon. Uh, let's see. Next question comes from... Angela, or should I say Arnold, what is the best strategy for someone who is brand new to investing? What is the best strategy? That's a pretty detailed answer there, my friend. Because the way I'm going to answer that question is the way I usually answer it. That depends. Because when you're doing real estate investing, the best strategy is going to be the strategy that solves the problem that you're having that you best suited for. For example, if someone is completely broke and they need money right away, the best strategy for that person could be wholesaling. It could be tenant placement. It could be guaranteed rent program. It could be house hunting or being a bird dog. So that strategy is basically based on what that person need real estate to do for them. If you need a large lump sum of income, that strategy of choice could be host rehabbing. So rehabbing can generate large lump sums of income. Now, and it can take anywhere from two, three, five, six months to realize the results of that rehab flip, depending on the actual situation of where that deal repair is needed in that property, but that's how you create large lump sums of income. 
Now, if you're talking about passive income, generational wealth, you could be going or going down the path of buying and holding apartment buildings, residential properties, renting out as landlord. Guaranteed rent, rent to own. So it's really a product of one, what do you need real estate investing to do for you? But secondarily, but most importantly, what strategy suits you best? You ought to remember that each strategy has a learning curve. And that learning curve could be this great, or it could be this great. So look at what you're talking about and what you're trying to do in real estate investing. And that's going to be the direction that you will want to go. Now, let's figure out something. If you are really feeling this information I'm giving you guys right now, do me a favor, heart it up, like it up. I want to see those hearts. I want to see those likes. I want to see all of those emojis come into life right now. Beto, thank you for being on the broadcast, my friend. Uh, Sapa, thank you for being on the broadcast. Let's see, let's see. Richard, thank you for being on the broadcast. Jason, I'm waiting to hear from you, my friend. Drop a question in that comment section. I know you got a bunch of them down there. Gwen, thank you for being on the broadcast. Stephanie, the hostess with the mostest. Thank you, thank you, thank you for spending your time and being on the broadcast. Heart it up, like it up if you're enjoying the information I'm giving to you guys right now. Question number three comes from Tavis. Tavis asks, can you still do a short sale on a property that's listed on the MLS? Can you still do a short sale on a property that's listed on the MLS? Absolutely you can. However, there's two different situations involved with this. And here's what I mean by that. Number one, my question is, is the property already listed as a short sale or not? If the property is already listed as a short sale property, then of course you can do a short sale on that property. However, if the property isn't listed as a short sale property and you still want to do a short sale or propose a short sale to that person, you're going to have to go through that actual homeowner. And you're going to have to find out the information you're going to need for in order to even propose doing a short sale on that property. And here's what I mean by that. You're going to want to know what the mortgage balance is, what the mortgage payment is. And here's the reason why. Most short sales don't happen. In fact, I can almost say almost all short sales don't happen unless the person is behind on their mortgage payments. So that's one qualification you're going to want to have in place. Now, what it also helps that there is a hardship situation with the homeowner. It also helps that the property is in need of repairs. And it also helps that the person may be upside down. Now, it's not mandated, but it helps the situation. We've done short sales on properties where the property was five months late, 10 months late, 15 months late, even 18 months late meaning the owner hadn't made a mortgage payment in 18 months. I'm going to say it again. The, order, the owner hadn't made a mortgage payment in 18 months. And we were able to structure that property as a short sale and make that deal happen. As a matter of fact, I think the profit on that deal was about fifty-two, fifty-three $53,000, maybe a little, bit, a little bit more than that. But it was a great deal. The situation was there because the owner was in a hardship situation. The mortgage payment had not been paid in almost two years, 18 months. And the actual property had a little bit of equity, but the equity could not be realized because it was over $40,000 worth of repairs that was needed. So those are things you want to have in place, Tavis, in order to approach that homeowner. So the answer to your question is yes, if it's already listed as a short sale, you can go ahead and 
do a short sale on the property. And secondarily, you will have to speak with the owner to uh, propose the short sale. And yes, they will be represented by an agent that will execute the short sale process for them or a short sale expert for them. I hope that answers the question. Next question comes from Jason, Jason, Jason. Jason says, I'm looking to market to FISBO owners and tenant buyers. What are your recommendations? Jason, oh my God, I'm going to tell you, my friend, the majority of our deals that we are getting right now um, are coming from FISBOs. And I'm talking about the, the structured deals, not the, the wholesale deals. The majority of our structured deals are coming from FISBOs on the various marketing platforms. And here's what I mean by that. We're going after individuals on Craigslist. We're going after individuals on Zillow. Zillow. As a matter of fact, we are scraping Craigslist for sale by owner. My team is also scraping for sale for rent by owner. And we're also scraping from Zillow and all the directory websites where we have access to telephone numbers, access to these types of information as well. And what we are doing uh, is basically reaching out to these individuals and following up with them with automated messages. As a matter of fact, let me show you exactly what I mean. I'm going to go ahead and log into my Podio account. And I'm going to bring up on the screen, as soon as it comes up, I'm going to bring up on the screen uh, exactly the system that my team has created that we are using to follow up on these different sites like I just mentioned. Um, it can be extremely challenging if you're doing it manually, but it works. So the question now is exactly what are you doing and how are you following up with your individuals that are in these different situations? Because what you're looking for is motivated sellers that have properties for rent, properties for sale, that you can basically monetize the situation with by taking over payments and so on, owner structured financing, guaranteed rent, tenant placement, rent to own, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, uh, let me see if I can pull my desktop up. Right now, I am in my accounts and I'm going to pull up let's make sure this bad boy is working right come on log in we're having a little difficulty in the technical side let's see if we can get this thing up and running wouldn't you know it I think Podio is having an issue right now on their end because my workstations aren't coming up. So let me try one more thing and see if we can get this to come up so I can show you exactly what we're doing. Give me a brief minute. Okay, we are now ready to show you. So if you're looking at our system right now, you should see my Facebook for sale by owner Craigslist app. Now this is how we're doing it, uh, Jason, and it's very ingenious. My team created an actual app that actually goes into Facebook. And when it goes into Facebook, it actually pulls all the information from the actual campaign. I'll give you an example. Let's click on this one. This lead came in on the 27th. So what we're doing is, if you scroll down, you'll actually see the actual Facebook, the uh, Craigslist post. I'm sorry, I said Facebook, but Craigslist post. And you just click on that post, and it will open up into Craigslist. And you see all the details that comes with it. So what we are doing, we are basically clicking on the reply button here and we're copying and pasting all this information as well as the information here in the actual fields along here. So the first name, last name, if there's a first name, property address, what the price is, the person is asking, their phone number and so on. 
Now, once we do that, Jason, all we have to do is click this little button right here, and it will send them an email and a text message, letting them know we're interested in buying that property. Then we go ahead and start the follow-up sequence. Every day they don't respond to us, and keep this in mind, every day they don't respond to us, they will get another message sent to them. Letting them know that we're interested in buying or interested in doing rent to own or interested in doing tenant placement. So that's basically how we're automating scraping on Zillow, Facebook, Zillow, I keep on saying Facebook, Zillow, Craigslist, and so on. We're using technology that my team has created to do that process. I hope this helps. Now, let's see what other questions do we have. Carmen B., I live in Los Angeles, and I am doing my first short sale. Congratulations, Carmen. Uh, doing my first short sale. Can you explain how I do the LLC assignment to an investor? This process confuses me. Great question, Carmen. Okay, how you would do an LLC assignment is simple. When you put the property under contract, First of all, you want to make sure you put it into the entity of the LLC that you're going to use. Now, that LLC does not have to be created yet. Keep that in mind. It does not have to be created. But you want to have it created, so you want to make sure that that LLC is available. And the way we do that, excuse me, the way we do that is by putting the property in the address name and then going ahead and contracting it in that name. So for example, if the property is 103 Main Street, then we would basically call the actual name or the entity that we're going to buy the property in 109 Main Street LLC. And that's what we assign the contract as, 109 Main Street LLC. Now that LLC, nine times out of 10, has not been created. It's not going to be created until one or two things happen. And should I say this is an end or or scenario? Once you get the property under contract, you can go ahead and create the LLC. Or once you find a wholesale buyer, you can go ahead and create the LLC. I like the latter as the best way to do it because you want to make sure that LLC is nice, clean, and fresh. What that means is that that person who is you're going to assign that LLC to is going to be the person who wants to make sure that there's nothing attached to that LLC. So the newer the LLC is, the better it's going to be for your buyer who's not going to have any headaches or not going to have any situations where they'll say, hey, I can't do that deal um, because I'm not so sure about the LLC. So that's the best way to do it. You're putting it in an LLC, then you're assigning. Come on over here, give me a kiss, baby. Then you are assigning that LLC to your end buyer, making them the actual members of that LLC when you create it. Thank you, guys. That's my beautiful wife. She's about to go somewhere, and she said good morning, everybody. So that's the way I recommend doing it if you're doing it in an LLC. Uh, all of this, of course, is basically making sure you have the right title company you're working with and so on and so on and so on. Next question comes from Greg can you touch can you touch on using a nonprofit for investing in real estate Greg you must have been on that platform where we did last time uh, we had a actual duru interview where we interviewed a young lady who actually created my nonprofit uh, Stephanie Poplar and she talked about how we could use nonprofits for real estate investing. And one of the ways, Greg, that you can use a nonprofit for real estate investing is basically with HUD. If you look at HUD classification, you have a couple of different classifications. Owner, occupied, um, nonprofit, and investor. Well, the classification of nonprofit and owner, occupied has first dibs of everything that comes new on HUD. So if you have a nonprofit, you're able to go after property, go at properties that owner occupants can go after because of you having that nonprofit, which means you could get better deals, better opportunities. Now, that's prior to the property being classified as investor property. So those are that's one of the reasons why or one of the good reasons for the nonprofit working with real estate investing. Another good thing is as a nonprofit, you can get discounts and free I repeat, 
you can get free stuff from Lowe's. You can get free stuff from um, Home Depot and other carriers donated to your nonprofit. I'm talking about materials for your rehabs and so on that they are we willing to give you um, to support your nonprofit as long as you're not selling the material. So these are things in which your nonprofit can do for you to benefit you and your real estate business. Thank you. That's a great question, Greg. Uh, Jason, I hope that answered your question earlier. Dwayne, welcome to the broadcast. If you guys are getting great information from this broadcast, like it up, heart it up. I need more comments. I got a boatload of comments that's already been emailed to me. If you want to have your comments read on a future call, all you have to do is head on over to charles at realdealmeetup.com. Email me at charles at realdealmeetup.com to get your questions answered on live now next question comes from mike how do you choose the right va to work with mike that's a very very good question and there's a lot of things you want to have in place when you're working with vas it's not really a mystery the key is the interview process and making sure that you're choosing the right VA that can do the job. Now, a couple things you want to keep in mind. That this business is all about knowing what you are doing. In other words, you want to make sure that your VA knows what the hell they're doing. And there's no way in the world you can do that if you don't know what the hell the VA is doing yourself. So in other words, the first thing you want to do is make sure anything that you having your VA do, you at least need to know how to do it and or how it should be done right. That's the number one thing I've seen in the past, how people lose a great deal of money and a great deal of time working with the wrong VAs because they have never done the things they're asking the VA to do. And they don't know what's supposed to be done when it's supposed to be done right, which means the VA could totally take advantage of you. And yes, it does happen. You do get VAs that's going to take advantage of you. So make sure you can do or have done at the bare basics what you are asking that VA to do. Secondarily, there is a number of sites out there that you can use. Uh, Upwork, Fiverr, GetAFreelancer.com, 99designs, uh, Craigslist, PH. Uh, there's so many other sites out there that you can use for VAs. The key is making sure, and one of the ways in which we really make sure we get the right VA, because I have VAs stamped all across my business model. One of the ways in which we make sure we use a go get the right VA is we give our VAs that we want to work with micro task, a small task to, to accomplish. And based on how well they do that micro task, then we bring them on in my organization. So that's another key factor. Um, give your VAs micro tasks to start off with. Don't make them a permanent uh, virtual assistant until they've uh, passed your micro task test. I hope that answers your question. Next question comes from Karen. Karen wants to know, can you wholesale a property that's listed on the MLS? And pretty much we covered part of this a little bit on the prop on the situation where somebody had a short sale and they wanted to wholesale it. So the answer to that question is absolutely you can wholesale a property that's on the MLS. As I mentioned with the short sale property, the key is uh, making sure you contract the property in the name of an LLC. And we're going to also introduce something else to you guys. You can also contract the property in the name of a trust. Depending on your sophistication in the business, you could use an LLC and or a trust. Now, the key here is this, that not many investors know about trust. So you'll be better off using what's most familiar in our industry, and that's an LLC. But the trust close is similar to the LLC. It's just a matter of actually putting the property in the actual trust and assigning or reassigning the beneficiary interest of that trust over to your end buyer. 
Almost the same situation as you are doing with the LLC clothes. You're putting the property in the LLC, you're contracting it in the LLC, and you're assigning that LLC, or you're, should I say, you're making the managing member of that LLC your end buyer. So it's pretty much the same process, except there's a little bit higher level of sophistication. So you want to make sure that your buyer is up to speed with you using the trust clothes and or the LLC clothes, because that's the key. The key to you wholesaling these deals is going to be your end buyer, their willingness to take the LLC and or the actual trust. So answer your question. Yes, you can, can, can wholesale properties that's on the MLLSS. And yes, we are doing it. Hold on one second. We are having a little bit of technical difficulty. Now, the next question comes from Kletzas, who says, do you JV in Charlotte, North Carolina? No. Do I JV in North Carolina? Absolutely. Unfortunately, we don't. But I do have partners in North Carolina that if you have a deal, I'll be willing to JV with them with. So technically, we're not doing it right now. But if you have a deal in North Carolina, I could put something together where we could joint venture together. Yes. So send that deal over to me. Uh, email address is charles at realdealmeetup.com. That's charles at realdealmeetup.com. And we'll take it from there. So let's see who we got on the broadcast right now. We got Teal Williams on YouTube. Carmen B on YouTube. Jason on Facebook. We also have my other friends, Kamate on Facebook, Randy on Facebook, Dwayne on Facebook, heart it up, like it up. We would love to hear from you guys. Thank you, 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 thank you. Princess, thank you for being on Facebook. Now, let's go over the next question on our list. Now, if you want to also submit a question, remember, head on over to Charles at realdealmeetup.com to submit your questions. That's Charles at realdealmeetup.com to submit your questions. Okay. The next question comes from James. James wants to know, can you explain how to do subject to deals? Let's see, on Instagram, we got a couple of people too. Thomas is on Instagram. Renee is on Instagram. Richard is on Instagram. Um, Buy More Houses is on Instagram. Thank you guys for tuning in. Can you explain how to do a subject to deal? Yes. So, uh, let's talk about how we do subject twos because we're not like every other business out there that's doing subject twos. One of the things that I never do is hold a subject to for longer than six months if I have to. Um, some investors hold subject to for years. Don't do that, in my opinion. And the reason why I say that is because holding a property subject to, you could be susceptible, susceptible to the actual issues that the landlord or the owner, should I say, that the owner will have during those years that could come down the pipe. And what I mean by that? Owner could file bankruptcy, could get a judgment against the property, and so on and so on and so on. All these things you'd be responsible by taking them by taking them on by way of subject to that could curtail your ability to do what you want with the property if your long term goal is to sell the property. Now, the way I like doing subject twos is this, and let's talk about what a subject two is. A subject two is basically taking over the property with the current encumbrances in place, mortgage in place, and so on. In other words, you're taking over the mortgage payment, which is what we call the classic subject to, and you're actually putting that property or having that owner put that property in a trust, and then you're being assigned the beneficiary interest of that trust, and based on that process, you are now making mortgage payments on behalf of that homeowner, and knowing or believing that the bank could care less where the payments are coming from. Now, how people get in trouble with trust is when one, they stop making payments, two, they don't explain the process 
very well to the seller who you are getting the subject to from and the seller reaches out to the bank and tells them, hey, I'm not owning the property. Now, is a subject to legal? Technically, it's not. I'm being totally honest with you. Um, the only aspect of that process that's legal or what we would call on the white hat side is the fact that the owner can put the property in a trust. As a matter of fact, there's a court ruling called the Garden St. Germain Act that state that. An owner can put a property in a trust for asset protection. However, the way we are getting around the call, the do on sale clause, because if the owner transferred title and don't notify the bank, it could trigger what's called the do on sales clause. And the way investors get around that is by having the owner put the property in a trust and then being named the beneficiary interest of that trust. But it's still, excuse me, but it is still in violation because the Garn St. Germain Act stated that the person, meaning the owner, could put the property in the trust as long as they're maintaining the beneficiary interest of that trust. When the investor takes the beneficiary interest, it's now considered in violation of Garn St. Germain. Now, do investors do it? Yes. Like I mentioned, we've done it. You have to work, you have to basically base the risk on the reward. You have to say, yes, Charles, uh, I think the reward is worth perhaps um, having a loan call due. The reward is worth perhaps uh, being in a situation where the Seller could slip up and um, ruin your situation. If you decide that, uh, then that may be something you want to do. The only way we would do it is in a situation, I'll give you an example of an actual deal that we did. We had a property in uh, Northwood, Baltimore. It was in 21239 zip code. And this was a property that we took over subject to. Uh, the actual numbers were something like, $54,000 mortgage on the property. The house needed about $25,000 worth of work. The value was about one fifty. The seller really just wanted to get rid of the property. They didn't even want the property anymore. So we basically structured a deal subject to seller put up the house. We rehabbed the house, gave the seller money up front, and then gave the seller money when we sold the property. All parties happy. Now, notice the fact that I said we sold the property. The property was sold within six months. So that's a situation where I'm willing to do a subject to. I'm not going to do a subject to if I'm going to hold that property for a year or so. I'm going to do some other type of transaction, land installment contract, wraparound mortgage, rent to own, something different than a subject to. So that's the way in which we do them, and that's the way I recommend you doing them. However, you are your own person. Next question. From Candice. Everywhere I go online, I see people talking about funnels. Can you explain exactly what is a funnel and how do funnel work for real estate investors? Absolutely. Now you're talking my kind of language, Candace. A funnel is basically the process you do to take a person from a prospect to a lead to a sale. Think about what I just said. The process that you have in place that takes a person from a prospect to a lead to a sale. One, two, three. Now, that process be, can be a number of ways or a number of things. You could have a follow-up process in place where you're contacting the seller by way of voicemail, you're contacting the seller by way of cold calling, you're emailing the seller, you're doing ringless voice message, you're doing all these different things. But keep in mind what we're talking about, you're capturing that information on the website. Keep in mind what we're talking about is your process. And that's what's called the funnel. The process that takes them from here to the point where you're making money. Real estate investors can benefit mightily from doing funnels. We have funnels in several areas of our business, from buyers to sellers to renters. Almost every aspect of our business process has a funnel in place. Now, the tool that we use is multiple tools to create the funnel. 
We use ClickFunnels. I've been using ClickFunnels now for almost probably three, four years. Uh, we use lead pages. That's another aspect of the funnel building that you could use. Somebody that's new in the business and doesn't have a lot of money, you may want to use something like a prop stream. Not prop stream, I'm sorry. Uh, something like a lead pages. Because lead pages is, I think it's only like $67 a month. Um, and there's also plugins out there you can do for WordPress that will allow you to create funnels at a one-time cost. Um, my ClickFunnels account is about $297 a month. We have multiple funnels. And like I mentioned, buyer's funnels, seller's funnels, rental funnels. Um, my whole business is a funnel. <laughs> and I kid you not, it truly is. So real estate funnels is an intricate part to your business. Reach out to me. I'd love to go in more details with me. Reach out to charles at realdealmeetup.com. Charles at realdealmeetup.com. And Mr. Uh, Hammonds, that is correct. That is the correct email address. Next question comes from Quentin. What is the best way to get probate deals? Now, before I answer that question, remember, guys, we have a total of three meetings coming up in the next 30 days. I would love for you to attend those meetings if you're able to. We have the Real Meals and Deals meeting that is coming up, and that meeting will be on July the 3rd at Ida B. Table. We also have the Baltimore REI Networking Mixer. That is going to be at the Lord Baltimore Hotel. That will be on July the 27th. And last but not least, the Real Deal Meetup Event, fourth Saturday every month at the realdealmeetup.com. Look forward to seeing you guys there. Question comes from Quentin. What is the best way to get probate deals? Well, Quentin, I'm going to say, really, it depends on your financial situation, and it depends on where you are at. First of all, if you're in Maryland, you can go to a number of the courthouses and pull the actual probate deals. I love pulling probate deals. Let me back that up. I love getting probate deals from the courthouse. I don't pull them anymore. I have my people that work in my company that actually go to the courthouse and pull the deals. So I could just as easily buy the actual leads. Eh, to me, I want the the um, urgency of getting deals that are brand, getting leads that are brand new, as opposed to not knowing where the leads are coming from when you buy them from a list source. So I like the approach of having my people go to the courthouse and actually pulling those leads. Um, uh, there's several courthouses you can go. As a matter of fact, if you want a copy of my probate lead sheet sheets, meaning it shows you how to pull the actual probate leads from Baltimore City and Baltimore County Courthouse, reach out to me, uh, email me at charles at realdealmeetup.com, charles at realdealmeetup.com, and I'll send you my white papers on how to pull probate leads from Baltimore City, Baltimore County Courthouses. Now, that's one way of doing them, pulling them yourself, and I think that's the best way of doing them. Um, put your name in the comment section, and I'll make sure you get them as well. Let me know, hey, Charles, I want your probate list. Put that in the comment section. I'll make sure you get the probate cheat sheet as well. Now, like I said, there's a number of ways of doing it. One is pulling it live. The other, which is hiring a service to pull the list for you. The key to that service that you hire, you want to make sure that the lists are fresh, the leads are fresh. You're not talking about leads that come every three months, which means they're three months old, and someone else probably have already reached out to those individuals. I like to get my leads on a weekly basis. My people go to the courthouse every week and we pull leads. Now, we go back as far as 18 months. What we're looking for is probate cases. Now, what is probate to begin with? Let me, go, let me give a little bit about what probate is. Probate is what happens when somebody passes away and it passes away without a will. So that's where probate kicks into place. Now, during the process of probate, you have what's called a personal representative being named. That personal representative that's being named during that process is the person that is in charge of selling off the assets to that actual house or the assets to that actual person that passed away. Now, you want to make sure now all assets in the, pro in the actual probate can contain houses. You have what's called a small estate and you have what's called a large estate. A small estate is an estate that is $35,000 and less 
or less in assets. A large estate is above $30,000 or less. So which estate do you think may have real estate in it? You are right, the large estates. Now, that doesn't mean that some small estates don't have real estate in it because we have houses in Baltimore that have value of five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. So yes, it could be in a small estate, but the majority of the properties that we are seeing are in the states that's classified as a large estate with $30,000 in assets or above. Now, once I have that information, we put that information and we skip trace that information and we also send a letter and or postcard to that personal representative letting them know that we're interested in buying that property. Now, we do what's called a follow-up drip campaign. That follow-up drip campaign occurs the first week we reach out to that person at least three times until we speak with the person. After that, we reach out to that person once a month until we can buy the property or the house is no longer available. That's what we call our drip process for our leads, especially probate. I hope that answers your question. Gary, I will make sure you get that probate list. Thank you for leaving a comment below. Adam, thank you for being on the broadcast. Camilla, thank you for being on the broadcast. Randy, thank you for being on the broadcast. Remember, if you want a copy of my probate cheat sheet, just in the comment section below, just leave a copy. Hey, mad scientist, I want a copy of your probate cheat sheet, and I'll make sure you get it. Tavis, Tavis, good morning, my friend. Thank you for being on the broadcast. I already answered your question, man. So um, I will also put it in Facebook, but thank you for being on the broadcast. Final question comes from, or should I say, one of the final questions comes from Kristen. Kristen asks, how do you set up property insurance on a seller finance deal if your name is not on the deed? And this is a question that came to me on Facebook from the Real Deal Meetup Facebook group. Now, guys, I'm going to actually give you or put in the link to the Real Deal Meetup Facebook group. I want you guys to hit on over there if you can. I know not if you can. I want you to hit over there to the Real Deal Meet Facebook group. I want you to go ahead and sign up for it. It's a free group, of course, but it's a closed group. So you have to be approved. And I want you to attend at least, or should I say invite at least 10 of your friends to my Real Deal Meetup Facebook group. I'm going to put the link below. So I want you to invite at least 10 friends. And hold on one second. Let me get that link right now. Hmm. And for those of you that do that, for those of you that invite 10 people to join the Real Deal Meetup Facebook group, you will be getting a dynamic bonus from yours truly. Now, you guys know about some of the bonuses I give out. I give out bonuses worth thousands of dollars. No questions asked. So here's the actual link that I want you guys to go ahead and post. Here we go. I'm putting it. Take this link and invite at least 10 of your friends. Go ahead and become a member of that group and invite at least 10 friends to get your hands on my bonuses. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, back to the final question, or should I say one of the final questions. If you have any other questions, make sure you put them in the comment section below. Question, how do you set up property insurance on a seller finance deal if your name is not on the deed? Now, the key part is what you said last, Kristen, if your name is not on the deed. Because if your name is on the deed, you're able to actually easily get insurance, homeowner insurance, because your name is on the deed. If your name isn't on the deed and you're looking to get insurance for the property, there's only two ways to do it. One, you could either have your name added to the deed, or should I say three ways. Two, be added as an additional payee. Three, not get homeowner insurance, but get renter's insurance to cover your assets in the property um, that you're taking over owner financing. So those are really the only ways you can execute what you are asking me in this question, Kristen. I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's see who else do we have out there. Uh, Jason, thank you for being on the broadcast. Clarence, Beto, Gwen, 
Stephanie Poplar, thank you, my actual friend for nonprofits. Dwayne McCullough, thank you for being on the broadcast. Randy, uh, Camilla, Adam Ships, thank you for being on the broadcast. Gary McKean, thank you for being on the broadcast. Once again, guys, this is Charles Blair, the Mad Scientist. We are about to sign out. If we don't have any other questions, I want to thank each and every one of you. Remember, if you have questions for future broadcasts, just send them over to charles at realdealmeetup.com. That's charles at realdealmeetup.com. I want you to invite those friends and family members that you think would get a benefit being a part of the Real Deal Meetup community. I believe in paying it forward. So if you know somebody that's looking for financial freedom, looking to get out of that rat race, looking to fire their boss, definitely, definitely, definitely invite them over to the Real Deal Meetup Facebook group. We put the link right there below. 10 friends, take care. Charles Blair, Mad Scientist, signing out. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.